So thank you. Morning, everyone. Thank you, Eva. Um, I'm trying. I do. Um, I deliver training in the Scottish Government on international negotiations. Just a model. Takes a whole day. Very complicated. Checking the agenda here. I've got 20 minutes, and I know we're running behind schedule, so I'm going to try and tram through a bit. Um, I'm going to try and use today to do a little bit of myth busting, if I can. Um, that's why I was so keen to accept the invitation to talk um, here this morning. I often find myself in an audience or reading um, so-called professionals about negotiations and what they're going to do as a coastal state and we'll just have this and we'll just do that and I just think oh my goodness have you ever, ever have you ever been in that room do you ever understand how relationships operate um, on clause that Richard just talked about some of the some of the issues we have there yes we have to share surplus um, if you have a surplus but that doesn't mean to say you can't do other things if you choose to do that there's lots of things that you can do um, so I want to just show you some of the complexities, show you some of the challenges um, that, that we face, um, and try and take you through some of the myths that might be there. Of course, as a negotiator myself, um, I'm probably responsible uh, through a matter of convenience of creating some of the myths. That, <laughs> that can be quite helpful as well to do. Um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of points that, that Richard said and, and following on from the Cabinet Secretary. Um, Yes, there can be tensions between Westminster and the devolved administrations. Um, fisheries, however, is fully devolved. So my speech will be a little bit about Scotland and a little bit about the UK, but it'll be a U currently it's envisaged a UK coastal state. Um, international discussions are reserved. However, as always happens when you get more than one lawyer in a room, you get more than one piece of opinion or advice. Um, but it's not fully reserved um, if the operational functioning of what you're talking about um, is a fully deserved fully devolved matter. So you're negotiating and discussing in an international forum about things that are fully devolved and therefore we would contend that consent is required in terms of that because it's about access to Scottish waters, it's about rules in Scottish waters. Those discussions outside my pay grade and so forth will, um, will go on, I'm quite sure. What I would like to reassure you all is that the relationships across the days are very good. I've got a friend and colleague, um, Colin Faulkner, who you'll be hearing later on today, and others within DEFRA. Um, we make it work. Um, sometimes it's not brilliant for Scotland, but we have to bring together a package, and I'm sure that's what we'll do going forward. I'm sure there'll be some kind of agreement. My personal thoughts, I'm happy to say this publicly, is that we'll probably have to formalise that a little bit, because it won't always be myself and Colin and Nigel Gooding, so we might need to formalise that a little bit. But we do make it work, and I think I would like to reassure you now that despite tensions that you may hear about, that we can make it work. But also, I think we'd like to redress the balance a little bit. Scotland, for example, in the EU-Norway negotiations is a net contributor to the exchange, whereas the UK is a net beneficiary. Um, and I won't bore people about blue-whiting an Arctic cod that's a, a bit of a bugbear with, with um, everyone. So a bit of a mix um, on that. So um, Scottish waters, why is it so important to us? Uh, Mr Ewing uh, alluded to this. Um, over 12 non-Scottish nationalities at any one time are operating our waters. Um, ICES and Steckov identify that in terms of the richness, up to four tonnes of fish are available in our waters compared to only one tonne elsewhere in the EU. Over 80% of our catches come from our own waters. We don't tend to go um, too far away. Um, the exchange, the balance um, between where you want to fish at a UK level the EU, for the, top, for the top 20 stocks, the EU catches over 580,000 tonnes of fish in our waters. The UK catches some 90,000 tonnes of fish in EU waters, of which only 20,000 tonnes is done by Scottish vessels. It gives you a currency exchange of about 0.16, so for every tonne that the EU, EU catches in our waters, we only catch 160 kilograms in their waters, even less so um, for Scottish businesses. Um, that gives you a feeling of, as a negotiator, the dynamic that you're operating in. It also gives you, going forward, a potential currency to work with. You have to think about on what basis people talk about access to waters. Um, on what basis? Well, it'll be for access for fish, not exclusively, but probably. Are you going to change that currency? Is that, is that a level that you can start working with? Is that some kind of model that you can, you can operate through? And that's something that... Um, in Scotland, we're working um, very closely on developing through a, a very intricate model. And on value, it's 0.22, just out of, if you're curious about that um, element. So, very important in that sense. International negotiations, 
We're in the EU, so the EU um, has competence um, just now, so they have coordination. They never um, seem to get the ultimate best deal because they're always operating internally to try and compromise through seven or eight member states, and, and that's a challenge for them in doing that, whereas the coastal states are all looking after their individual um, elements and rights. It's quite a complicated structure um, with um, primarily Norway and Faroe, but also Iceland and Greenland and Russia as observers as well. Negotiations take place and then they get ratified through December Council. The UNCLOS point that you heard um, Richard talking about says that you have to um, set, determine the allowable catch of living resources in your economic zone. Um, there's a catch limit there, which is why primarily in our future fisheries we've said that we don't advocate um, in most cases, certainly mixed fisheries, the use of effort because you've always got to have a, a catch limit. And you do that either independently as a coastal state, if the fish is yours and it's only in your waters, actually, it's pretty rare for that to happen. So we have Clyde, Her we have Clyde Herring, we have some of our nephrops functional units, but apart from that, most other stocks, they don't understand or know there's lines on charts and they swim about, so they're shared. You have to do this collectively, um, and that's what brings the dynamic of international negotiation together. Very quickly, just um, Mr Ewing um, touched on this, I think I'll not read out the list. What I will say is that as a negotiator, and Marine Scotland, the Scottish Government, we won't go in with a positional approach. Um, a positional approach in negotiation is when you say, my number is 10, I'm not changing. If I don't get 10, I'm not doing a deal. That's ultimately doomed to failure, unless you're having a bit of fun, unless you're buying a second-hand car. Um, otherwise, it's far too important. Hundreds of millions of pounds of resource, tens of thousands of jobs, to go in and say I want 10 because I want to do a press release that says I got a double digit. You know, Don't have red lines. We will be positional, um, we'll understand, we'll be responsible. <laughs> We we'll want to walk out the room and to be able to say on what basis we agreed to do something or did that, hence the, my reference earlier on about potential um, currency um, as being, being, an, being an issue. Very quickly, I'll just run through some of these slides um, just to show you some of the complexity that the pelagic stocks, coastal states, pelagic stocks, macro, um, this one. So we have the five parties, EU, Norway, Iceland, Faroe Islands and Greenland and Russia as observers um, in there. We have an agreement, but it's only a three-party agreement. You see the shares. We set the TAC um, based on scientific advice. It was quite challenging this year. So we're in agreement between EU, Norway and Faroe. But Iceland and Greenland and Russia are out. We've set aside 15% um, for them to make the total allocation as coastal states 100%. States but actually, those who aren't in the agreement set unilateral tax. So we actually catch 120, 125% of the advised catch limit. That threatens the stock. The international negotiation has basically failed because you don't have all parties in and you're potentially overfishing the stock. That's a real challenge. That's why you can't just take unilateral actions. That's why you must engage with your partners, understand what their pressures are, try and come to some common ground and common understanding. Otherwise, what's the point? What's the point in increasing your share by 20% if other parties didn't recognise it, they carried on fishing their shares, and as a result, the stock went down by 50%? You're in a negative place. We need to be a little bit more realistic about the art of the possible in terms of shares, um, which will be a longer um, transition in terms of changing. And just to, just to highlight the complexity, this has happened over time. We set a share, it's there by our country, and then it gets divvied up internationally within the EU, then it's the Western Waters, then it's the North Sea, then there's rules about certain times of the year you can only catch it, um, and then there's various other outputs taken in there. We have something called a mackerel octopus. It's that complicated that nobody actually can know without using this model what your share will be until you plugged it in there. Um, it's, um, it's super complicated, uh, delivered over time, and it's hard to get people to move away from that um, as a negotiator because any adjustment tends to mean somebody feels they're losing and somebody feels they're gaining, and that's not a, that's not a, helpful, not a helpful place. 
I'm not going to labour these other slides um, just on time for standing up here, but we pretty much have failed across the Coastal States Forum. We don't have full party agreement in any of them, and therefore the risk in that area of overfishing is very high. Um, and I think going forward, that's something we will look to address. You'll see some maps shortly, which will sh suggest that we'll be key players, if not the key player, in trying to do that. Whether others want to play the game with us or not is, is a different story, but the responsible, sustainable approach will be, will be important in that. The EU-Norway, equally complicated, but this gives you a flavour as to what a coastal state going forward might do. We have something called a balance of exchanges. So we exchange fish for fish, and we have a cod equivalence to try and make sure that the value is, is roughly light. Um, what you'll find is a coastal state will be negotiating to try and get fish in in return for access. Richard talked about the expectation that access will continue. That is quite right, um, certainly if there's surplus. Um, and that's, that will be the genesis of the start of how you're going to try and secure some additional opportunities. A longer train will be changing your share, your relative share you'll leave with, your, which will convert to your coastal state share. And you might want to say, well, actually, that share's wrong because all the fish is in our waters, and therefore our share should be bigger. Um, that sounds pretty logical to me, and I'll, I'll show you some information. But other parties don't like that. They say, well, it's not just about where the fish are, Alan. What you don't understand is that there should be historic um, references that Richard talked on. So, well, I'm not so sure about that. Um, well, okay, the fish are in your waters 80% of the time, and we want to come into your waters to catch them. But what you don't understand, Alan, is the 20% of the time they're in our waters are when they're feeding. And if they don't feed in our waters, then they're not fit and healthy and valuable to catch in your waters. So unless you come to some kind of deal, we'll catch them all in our waters, even though they're maybe not in the best state. Or this is where they spawn. They don't spawn in new waters, and if you don't have baby fish, then you won't have stocks going forward. All of these elements, blue whiting is the classic example. The EU has a compelling case to increase its share of blue whiting. Um, has been trying to do so for four years. We have no agreement on shares, because just to increase our share by 5% um, has meant the complete collapse of the negotiation. To take a unilateral position and say we're just going to do it is risky for the stock. Pharaoh did that for mackerel um, a number of years ago and ended up with trade sanctions, not just on seafood products, but across a whole range of products. Fortunately for them, they had access to Russian markets that offset the, offset the problems. Um, so unilateral actions, we'll just take it, we'll just do it, tend not to, tend not to work. They're dangerous, they're risky. So you need to work um, through principle, through logic, through rationale, through understanding who your partners are and what their needs are and how you can find that, how you can find that middle ground. Just touched on the, on the Faroese there, the, they increased their macro share. It was, a, it was a strange negotiation carried out with the EU. They increased their macro share because they said the macro was more prevalent in their waters now and it was feeding there. It wasn't particularly good quality, but it would only be good quality when it came back into your waters because it was feeding there. But bizarrely, despite the fish being in their waters in greater abundance, they wanted to catch 30% of their share in our waters. That was for an economic uh, benefit from their... It sounds illogical, but it is logical to them because they want to catch it at the best quality. Um, and these are the kind of dynamics that, that start playing in when you, when you understand or start to scrape, peel back the surface a little bit on some of these agreements. Again, Richard touched on, on this. Um, it's not just the coastal states. It's not just NIAF. There's a whole range of other forums that we may want to get engaged in. So currently, the Scottish Government um, doesn't join our UK colleagues in too many of these. The UK is probably present, if not at least as an observer, sometimes as an active participant in the regional fisheries management organisations. But there will be some that, going forward, I've already identified and I'm enhancing my international teams that we'll want to play a part in. Um, ICAT tuna, west of Scotland. Um, you know, maybe not just immediately a commercial fishery, but you can certainly see something around tourism, catch and release. Um, there's, there, we don't have any tuna quota, we don't have anything, but that's a forum that we would have a legitimate um, interest in. So we'll have to start expanding our wings a little bit. Um, and that just shows you there's an awful lot of them. Um, and some quite attractive travel for some of my team as well. I'll have to, I'll have to sense check that before they, before they start um, heading off. And then December Council, I'll flick past this slide as well. It's primarily the forum where you ratify all of the agreements that you've done. 
your fishers agreements and set the tax for just the internal stocks where the stocks are just within EU member states. And it all comes together in a tax and quota regulation and there's your fishing opportunities for the year. Sounds pretty simple. Some of the challenges we've faced, um, very quickly again, EU Norway, North Sea Cod and Whiting, um, real problem, real challenge with that. EU Norway and December Council, um, we would say that the EU were trading away species and fish that, was, that we needed. Ling, a choke species landing obligation, we don't have enough of it, yet they're giving it away as part of a negotiation, you know, but it's their competence, we can't stop them. They're trying to do, they're trying to do the compromise between all member states. Um, West of Scotland, Cordon Whiting and the, um, the zero tack issue um, was pretty much what my time was dominated with um, at this year's December Council. Um, very complicated output um, that very few people understand um, and trying to make it operable is really challenging. The landing obligation, as I said already, the coastal states, mackerel, blue whiting and ash, we've agreed tax, but we don't have full agreement across the, the sharing arrangements and the management, so therefore the management of those stocks is flawed. Um, we're probably overfishing them all. And I think that's starting to be reflected in the science, unfortunately. Touched on the EU Faro challenge around the access, that's something that I know I'll come under pressure if we become a coastal state to try and redress. Um, and I'm quite sure that my Faroese colleagues will be saying, oh, not so sure about that. Um, which, you know, we can't just go from 30 to zero or, or why, or can we not find another way around this, Alan? Um, and I'm sure we probably can um, to deliver benefits. And the NEAF working group on um, criteria, allocation criteria, they set up a working group for the blue whiting issue. I would suggest that for most stocks, my sign up advisors say for most stocks, um, the trawl surveys, the sweep surveys to show abundance are probably the right thing, but not for all stocks. This showed me that people wanted a list of criteria that ran into several pages. And then they wanted to have a three year negotiation on weighting that criteria. And that's how it's just not so straightforward as to the presence of it. So they wanted to say, well, actually, only 10% of the stock is in my waters for 10% of the time. Um, but at that, sorry, only the stock is in my waters for 10% of the time, but it's feeding there. So that weighting needs to be really high. And that's how other partners are trying to change the dynamic of the negotiation. So people say, oh, our territorial waters, our, our um, EEZ's going really big, all the fish are on our waters, therefore we can just get big shares. There's a lot of truth in that in terms of the logic. The deliverability of that is super challenging and will be a, will be a process. It won't be an overnight. Um, I think most people understand that, but I think it's important um, to reiterate um, that sense. Can I just say, in my experience, these challenges, these complexities, you can't just um, parachute individuals in to these negotiations and expect them to be successful. You need experienced people, you need qualified and trained people um, to do this, to deliver, um, to deliver outputs. It's, it's very important. I've seen so many examples of people with blank expressions in a room where they just don't understand the connections of what's going on. So I've been told to hurry up. A potential change in the dynamic. This is, this is the map that most of you are all familiar with. Um, the little pink bit is the EU's new EEZ. They're no longer the big player in North Atlantic fisheries. It will be the UK, Norway, Faro, managing collectively the shared stocks in that area. This is what I was talking about. Fish stocks don't change overnight, but this is for cod um, in the North Sea, 1988 to 2018. Survey data. 88, you can see the cod pretty well distributed across all areas. 2018, that distribution is very much concentrating back up into the north in Scotland. Even more pronounced than the west of Scotland. So you can imagine discussions around shares will be, will be complicated because there's a lot of history there. There's a lot of scientific evidence there. And you'll probably want to review, but you won't review these things every year. That was a 30 year timeline. Like I say, fish don't change that quickly, but they do change. You might be reviewing every five or 10 years to make sure you get it right. It's those very pictures that say why relative stability is such a hot topic in terms of shares and, and so forth. And just to finish, um, and quite shamelessly um, promoting our future fisheries that you've heard all about, um, we, if you want to know more about our principles, how we think 
we'll go about, how we'll define an additional opportunity, how we'll go about negotiating, how we'll treat our partners. It's all in here. Um, we're going to have workshops. I'm going to do, apparently, I'm going to do a video blog. I'm going to do a live Q&A. Um, I don't know how any of that works, there, but there'll be very clever people who'll, who'll set it up for me. Um, and there'll, there'll be workshops around the coast. Um, it's a discussion, not a consultation. We want to hear your views. My feedback I've got is that, thank you, Alan, you've been listening as opposed to hear some, hear some proposals. I like to call the workshops book signings myself, so there'll, there'll, be, plenty, there'll be plenty there, and I just encourage people to engage in that discussion. Um, and I think there'll be questions at the end of the session. Thank you.